we have almost full house. So uh, my name is Mike Trainer. I'm a professor of computer science. Uh, I'm here to speak with my colleagues at part of AU's Game Lab here um, about game research uh, and some ideas about how you might build these in the future. Um, so the so work is probably going to be a 7, 10-ish minute presentation, and then we'll just go down the line and uh, give our different perspectives on what game research means for us and some ideas for game research. So let's start with this idea. Uh, actually, many game presentations do this. We have to justify our discipline. Games are really significant. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you identify as a gamer, you don't even realize how significant they are. This is a whole um, arena filled with people uh, watching a um, uh, what's it called esports. So people watch this game, League of Legends and, and StarCraft, and just fills arenas, and it's just a huge industry that you don't even know about unless you're a gamer. What's cool about that is um, it means that games are a cultural form that we can use to express ideas. So here's a game uh, called Papers, Please uh, that came out recently. It was actually a big, uh, a big commercial success, which is shocking. Um, it's a game about being a border person checking passports and who do you allow into the country or not. And so you wouldn't think that like all these people or youngsters would be playing this game dealing with these kind of issues, but they are. Okay, so the next idea I want to say is games are compelling, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, maybe even addicting or persuasive, whatever you want to call them. So here's a, a tasteless uh, application of this where people get really hooked on uh, machine gambling. Um, but we can take the lessons from this about uh, game design and uh, get promote behaviors that are actually good for us. So here's uh, Nike's app, which takes advantage of some like gamification ideas uh, to influence people to run more. And uh, you get these Olympic uh, Olympic people talking in your ear when you hit mile five when you're running, that kind of thing, and say, yeah, I'm doing great, and I've leveled up to be um, faster than my friends, or whatever it is. Um, but, so those are two ways that games are, I think, important. Um, the thing, way I'm going to talk about it, what my research is, <coughs> I'm trying to explore how games are unique. So, as a medium or a cultural form, games are the uh, way that we can represent um, vast systems of rules and this kind of higher order representations about uh, the systematic ideas in our lives. So on the left is a screenshot of this very complicated game called Agricola, which you, um, anyone know that game, Agricola, come on. Yeah. Um, it's a very complicated game, and a very sick rule book, but it's simulating farming, essentially. Um, and it's a great game. Um, uh, on the right is code, random code. <laughs> so on, on, so in uh, board games, uh, players have to know about the rules and enforce them. Um, and, and get engaged in discussions about these kind of complex, non-trivial things. Uh, and then in video games, code enforces the rules. Um, but so, why is this exciting? Um, when you have a system of rules, you have what you call a playable model, right? So, in Super Mario Brothers, you might say uh, it is a game about a plumber running and jumping, uh, saving a princess, but really that's not what Super Mario Brothers is about. Super Mario Brothers is about a uh, representation of 2D physics. When you're playing this game, what you're actually thinking about, what you're actually doing, is playing with a representation of 2D physics. And to engage with this is to like, really deeply investigate this particular representation of how they implemented uh, mass acceleration, et cetera. Um, so I think one of the, the real powerful aspects of games is by this deep investigation into this playable model um, you, you start asking questions and, and reflecting upon kind of higher order com uh, complex thoughts. Um, so like in Super Mario Brothers, you're like, hey, why can I change direction in the air? I can't do that in real life. And then you start thinking about it, why is it the case that I can't change direction in the air? Blah, blah, blah. Um, now, who cares in a certain way about uh, 2D physics, right? That's not too exciting. But like I showed with the Papers, Please game, we can represent uh, much more exciting uh, or different complex ideas that help us understand how we live in the world. Um, a, a brief aside, uh, I want to note that games are, it might sound like I'm saying simulations are why games are good. That's part of it. Simulations are great. Um, but it's a really a, 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 different, uh, a different type of thing going on here. Simulations are trying to predict the future. They're trying to be accurate. Um, they're, trying, they're, they're useful in some way. Um, games are kind of like the, the cool kid version of simulations, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you, uh, it's a cultural form. Like the visualization, the presentation matters. Um, the way it actually, like, like, it's influencing your heart, right, more than influencing your, your cool, rational mind. Um, so, 
An example of this, which I think is extremely good, it's brand new, so you should look into it if you haven't and you're interested in this, is um, someone took this concept of the dynamic models of segregation. It's like a game theory paper from the 70s. And they made this, um, and you know, it's, you know, big, we're academics, we know, it's like graphs and stuff and lots of words. <laughs> um, and it's complicated. And um, you know, maybe even when you're reading, you don't even finish it because it's too long and boring. Um, and so someone made this thing called the parable of polygons. Um, which is a representation of this complex game theory concept. This is like fairly cutting edge, it might be a month old. Um, and you, you just kind of march through the paper um, in like an interactive, playable form, and by the end you're like, oh my god, I completely get it. And it's a really subtle, complex, nuanced idea they're trying to get at about segregation and how it happens in cities. And so, wow, how cool is it that there is a cultural form that we can play with that gets across subtle, nuanced ideas. That's kind of rare. So uh, a few Brief examples of how I've done this kind of uh, try to make playable models in my own work. Uh, I have some of my colleagues uh, here. Um, so Function Force is a game we're currently developing to help people play with and understanding uh, mathematical function transformation. So in this game, you control that little ship and you change the coefficients on these, this is a very early uh, version, um, on that sine function down there in order to change the amplitude frequency. Um, but you're just, you're playing it, right? You're, it, you're actually engaging with the concept we're trying to teach. Um, another example is the game Prom Week, uh, which uh, you construct and learn about the social lives of these uh, high school kids in the week before their prom. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, Professor McCoy might talk about it more. <laughs> okay, um, we made this together a while back. And um, the interesting thing about this is it's a very complex, nuanced, social world they live in. It's not a pre-scripted thing. These are really complex artificial intelligence games. Um, and another very early thing is this kind of untitled role-playing game we're working on. Um, this isn't even a screenshot from it, so I grayed out to make it clear it's not ours. Uh, but it'll look something like that. Um, it's, it's, that's kind of um, trying to make players engage with different cultures and kind of learn about this complex like system of society. So now you might be thinking, oh, oh well, the order's kind of off here. So how can you use this in the classroom, is my last slide. Um, but you might think like, oh, this is all good and fine. I don't know how to code. Um, there's you know, scary code again. I started showing that uh, slide from Agricola, the board game, which is a great game and, and promotes good conversation uh, among friends about a complex, a complex system you're playing with. Um, on purpose, because it's what we call like, an analog game or a non-digital game. So in your classroom, you might want to think of game activities that are uh, involved just cards and numbers on them, right? So like this card represents gold and I need six, or not gold, a uh, pollution or something, right? And if I have six pollution, then what's gonna happen is every turn this factory is going to degrade one token less or something, right? So that kind of representation, it doesn't have to be on a computer. Um, and then uh, another example, this is a great game um, made to represent the, the diamond trade in Africa. Um, and it was funny, it actually started as a board game and then it turned into a digital game on Nintendo DS. So um, let me just end to summarize how I think this would be a great like, classroom activity. Uh, something that we call a critical design, what they call it, critical gameplay. And this whole idea of, you're gonna, the, the general idea is you're going to create a system, some sort of representation, uh, and play with it. And the idea is that it, it's, and play it critically, right? So choose some subject, like um, you know, pollution. Um, break it down into parts, like decompose it, maybe be crude about it, right? Like don't, don't try to be too realistic and model it completely accurately. Then try to make a game about it, try to make the process, how these pieces uh, relate to one another. Play the heck out of it. Discuss why it doesn't represent the real world, right? Or why it's broken. And then reflect upon the decomposition you did in the first place. Yeah, and so that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, I think I will pass it on to Sure. Okay. Sorry. 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 So, <laughs> my name is Lindsay Grace, and I'm an uh, associate pro professor in the School of Communications and Film and Media Arts, and I'm also the director of American University's Game Lab and their studio. 
So I'm going to talk very quickly. Uh, if you missed something, feel free to say, wait, 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 what did you say? Uh, I have a lot of slides, but I promise I'll do it in less than seven minutes. OK. So uh, I'm going to talk about my research in games, and I'm going to talk about my research through games and how that is different. Uh, so first, about games, as uh, Mike Trainer suggested, uh, there is the requisite statistic that you need to understand about the scale of games in the world, right? So you often see this sort of 21.5 billion uh, back in 2013. It's now an $86 billion um, industry as projected for 2016, which we're almost there, uh, according to the Electronic Software Association. And then the other thing I always have to make people remember is that there's actually a reasonable gender split here. Um, so uh, ESA estimates 52% male, 48% um, female in terms of game players. So uh, almost a 50-50 split. And then I love this statistic. So someone went through and calculated that on average, um, 200 million minutes per day are played of Angry Birds. That's a lot of Angry Birds. <laughs> if you calculate the amount of time people are solving problems in Angry Birds, it comes out to about 16 years of problem solving. Uh, I want you to remember that because it's really important to some of the research I'm excited about. So 16 years of play for Angry Birds alone. So uh, let's talk about my personal experience. So I've been making games for a long time, off and on. Um, this is one of my first games. I always show this slide because it's the only remnant I have from 1986. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I've made educational games, like this game, to teach a variety of languages, first Mandarin Chinese, and then a Portuguese Criollo. Uh, I've also made commercial games. These are all games available on iOS and Android, so Google Play and the app stores. Uh, and then I've made some art games as well, so you can see the aesthetic for them. Uh, and I've made documentary games before. Uh, I make all these games by myself, but they kind of give you perspective of the range of work that I'm doing. Uh, and then I also make these sort of odd uh, hybrids between um, conventional play and conventional games and something a little different. So this one's actually about a, a boy's flocking algorithm and producing music from a visual image. So uh, my students do the same, right? So they make games about educating people. So this particular game is kind of a combination of a card game and a, um, and a digital game. You lay these cards down to meet um, specific objectives, like drawing a circle. And what you're doing is you're actually learning and practicing programming, but you're practicing it with these cards that then draw on the screen if you put them in the right order. So it's for order of operations. And the board games, like this intergenerational board game that's supposed to help uh, high school, pre-high school people, so junior high schoolers, uh, talk with adults about all the stresses, et cetera. Uh, in an environment that sort of levels the playing field for the conversation. Uh, and then my students also make commercial games as well. So these are a couple of games that did pretty well in the app stores. So the question is always sort of next, like what do you mean by games, right? So in my view, and this goes to some of the stuff that uh, my trainer introduced, games are really sets of interesting problems. So what does that mean? Let's look at Super Mario Brothers. We can play it. Okay, right? It's an easy one. A lot of people played it or seen it. So this is Super Mario Brothers, and if you look at it, it really is a series of problems. How do I get up there? How do I bonk that? How do I deal with whatever other issues? Uh, and so what I often tell my students in particular is that designers create problems. That's what we do. That's what we're really good at doing. And we try to create interesting problems. And then designers offer the solutions as well. So here's the problem I give you, and here are the solutions that I can provide. Um, or here are the solutions that are reasonable for this problem. So a solution may be bonking. Um, so designers frame problems and solutions. That's their task. That's what we do on a daily basis. And so we practice those solutions in games over and over again. So we bonk and we bonk and we bonk and we bonk and we bonk, right? Uh, and if you think of it that way, then games are really tests. Right? So we're looking at games as tests, which means designers are teachers. Because what we're doing is we're constructing the problem and saying, here are the solutions for you. So I'm really interested in teaching through games from this framing. And the way I do it is through this practice I call critical gameplay. So the way critical gameplay works is I make a bunch of games and show them all over the world, and they all have alternative play experiences. So I'll show you one. Um, this is actually uh, at the Art Science Museum in Singapore, and I brought two games. Um, they accepted two games for, for display, for exhibit. And the first game is a game called Bang. The way Bang works is as you move through the, um, through the space that looks like a conventional sort of war simulation, uh, you have the opportunity to shoot people. If you shoot people, you have to review the fictive history of their lives in reverse before you can do anything else. And it's given a very sort of wedding montage style. It's supposed to be hard hitting, but it's also supposed to be this sort of um, opportunity to question what we think about um, sort of backstories and characters and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and the other game I showed is a game called um, uh, You, a very meaningful game, which is actually lampooning a lot of the things we've done in social impact games by having the game all about you as a player character and finding a place for a character that looks like you um, throughout the game. So uh, I show these sort of in various environments. So you've got you know, sort of art museums, you've got um, sort of trade show type environments, uh, and we've got um, sort of community organized events like Boston Festival of Independent Games at MIT. 
Uh, and the idea is to help people question the way they play so that they go out and design other games. So I'm giving them odd problems and odd solutions, uh, and then letting them realize that the, the space that we're playing in is actually quite narrow, and we have a lot more to play with. So uh, I'm also really excited about letting people teach us. So designers learn a lot from players, and I think one of the things that uh, is really sort of like cutting edge next generation stuff is what we call human computation games. So has anyone heard of, heard of Fold It before? Uh, a few of you. The way Fold It works is it's basically a puzzle game, so you're, you're doing protein folding as a, as a game, and um, your solutions as a human being are uh, very effective and often more effective than trying to use a supercomputer to solve those problems because we have what we call sort of heuristic evidence. As um, people who've lived for 30 plus years, if you're my age, what's happened is um, you've learned a lot from the world and then you can translate that much better than trying to educate an algorithm. So um, these human computation games create real world solutions. So they take this, this protein folding data set, dump it into a database, and then analyze people's solutions for optimal solutions. And then they can actually design uh, medications around it and understand specific diseases. So I've written a bunch of things on human computation games in the last two years, uh, and the idea is just that, using people's heuristic understanding and analysis to solve complex problems through play. Uh, and I've written, I don't know, so there's four articles there, and the real idea is that there are a bunch of problems we can't solve, but people solve problems really well while they play games, so why not map a problem to a game and use the stuff that people have used or have solved in the games? So imagine, again, those 16 years of play going to solving things like hunger or um, energy use, uh, that's the idea behind human computation games. Mm. And uh, we've also kind of applied this idea to journalism. So journalism has some problems it needs to address. And so we've started this JOLT fellowship uh, with both professional fellows, one of which is here, and uh, three graduate or three new graduate students. And the idea is to try and address issues in journalism through game design thinking. So looking at that, um, the models that we use in games. And as a reminder, it's just a series of problems, right, and solutions that we specify. So designers create problems, designers offer solutions, and designers frame problems and those solutions. That's all I have. Thanks. world with uh, you know, Lieutenant Commander data, or who hasn't wanted a robot companion like iRobot? High fidelity, uh, interactive, at the human level technology that you can you can play with. So this is taking games up a, a one level of generalization and making interactive experiences that are really maybe the adult version of what the common conception of games are now. So like the movie Her, the, the, uh, the very interactive uh, uh, operating system of uh, that was you know very compelling and and uh, did uh, and showed a good story all the way from having like Sims like a uh, Sims game up here being what you uh, perceive in real life all the way through these fictionalized uh, uh, perspectives of technology like uh, in the Young Ladies Illustrated Primer by uh, uh, Neil Stevenson. So this is what we have now. This is what our current <coughs> state of interactive at the human level games have. This is the gold standard, the old republic. Uh, it really boils down to something that is choose your own adventure. That's the level of detail and nuance of, I guess, decision making and interactability that you have as a player with these games. So what uh, I like to do, what my research is about, is making things more playable. So we'll go back to this uh, example of the prompt that uh, Mike uh, talked about earlier with our game prompting. So also tying in Angry Birds. We have this stylized model of 2D like Newtonian physics that's tuned just right to make a compelling play experience when you throw a bird at a pile of eggs. You can also design these levels with this stylized physics so that there's a compelling thing to do. If you hit that pig just right, the entire uh, bundle of bricks, blocks, pigs, everything falls down in a compelling, satisfying way. We want to do that same design at the human level with AI-driven characters as something that's a problem. 
So if you had a reactive system of social physics, of stylized social rules that can tell a good story, that you can load up a good level, uh, you can have some really interesting experience. Like two girls showing up going to say Congress. What are their dates gonna do? Are they friends? Are they not? Are they fishing for a fight? Are the girls actually like posturing and then are they actually best friends and they planned this the entire time and they're just making a scene? Who knows? There's all sorts of good dramatic possibilities here. So one way to do this is to take information we already know, to take complex models, complex thoughts of things like social science and psychology, use those as a backbone, as a way to encode, as a metaphor uh, to put into, a, uh, to translate computationally uh, existing media artifacts or ethnographic data to make playable stories. So in this case, uh, for, for uh, the game Prom Week that uh, Mike had mentioned earlier, uh, taking Urban Goffman's work and maybe some pop <coughs> social psych like uh, games people play, looking at me pre-existing media sources to get the juicy bits, to get the drama knob turned up to 11 for your playable experience, taking those salient bits out and encoding them with respect to the sociology to make playable stories. So it's those playable stories <coughs> uh, that drive the, the projects that we're working on. One was Prom Week, which did really well the Infinite Game Festival and all this fun award stuff. Uh, it's a very much like a sandbox way to interact with and socialize with these characters. That same core technology, the AI system behind this, has been used, uh, used with DARPA and IARPA to make cultural training simulation games that are, uh, 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 you know, uh, very like dramatic fidelity, like you going in and trying to search a house for weapons, but your poor national soldier with causes trouble, and all of a sudden things go connect. Um, so how do you stop that from happening? That's sort of like the, the position you're you're put in as a player. And these can go all the way from you have a controller and you're playing a game like on your Xbox to being fully embodied and you actually being physically engaged with the experience. So where I want to go with that and how you can use this in the classroom is to, so we've talked about some interesting things about simulation, about human computation. I want to give you another take on this and use it as media. So you use a lot of video in your classroom uh, to uh, tell a different type of story than you would with a lecture, well, add interactivity into the mix. Add mm -hmm. games into the mix. Have them play a game that tells a story. Have them play a game that elucidates a social experience. And that act of actually pressing buttons and being complicit in the interaction of the space is another powerful metaphor that you can use. Uh, if we have a holodeck and we're working on it, you know, that'll, this will be as a, this will be a, a good effect. Good. And thank you. I'm Joshua Boyd. Well, you did. residence at American University. Um, I, I represent what Mike was talking about when uh, he mentioned the professor who teaches with games but can't code to save uh, I, I like to say I make lots of the pretty pictures, but um, I'm still a game designer. So what does that mean? Well, I'm working a lot in the, um, in the non-digital realm when I bring games into the classroom. I try to find ways to incorporate game systems into learning and educational activities. I'm going to talk about this today, uh, very briefly. Um, shifting through the slides on that one. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
There it goes, okay. Be very fast. Um, all right, so real brief. Um, I, I come from the world of indie game development. Um, I have my own studio in the area of Hyper Breakfast Studios. I make everything from fun zombie games um, to experiments with game art methods. So this is Zup. It's a very Twitch game friendly, quick distraction type game on iOS and Android uh, that I made with Craft Phone. Um, I also you know, write about game art and game art production. Uh, so I've, I've written a book on 3D modeling and how to uh, add 3D characters to your games. Um, but when I do academic game design, I like to focus a lot on games, the creative process, um, how games are built, how we can engage users in interesting ways. And that fits nicely into what I do in the classroom uh, with my teaching. I incorporate games uh, in, in a rather unusual way, rather than just bringing in a game and playing it. We certainly do lots of that, especially when I teach game history. Um, I also make the class itself a game by making my syllabus a rule book for a role playing game, like Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, a couple things that I've done. Uh, and I've also modeled interactions as games to teach um, skills in, in uh, professional fields like architecture. So I actually come from the world of architecture uh, in my previous life before being a game designer. So I've done a lot of work with games, game design, and the creative process. So um, one, one piece of work that I did a couple of years ago, I created Game Design and Architecture the Game. The idea was I took architecture students uh, from Catholic University and had them play this game where they would roll die uh, it's a very simple Monopoly-like game, but they would just roll die, the, the board would tell them how many changes they could make to a project, and they would go make changes to a, a, three, a three dimensional uh, project model on a computer. Well, the trick was, um, I actually had them play with their pre-existing studio groups that they were already working with to explore the different social dynamics that a game would provide. So rather than you know one person taking charge and kind of ordering people around, you suddenly had groups working in a horizontal fashion where they all had equal input. So I actually, uh, through playing this, one person even said, I yell at Alex way less. <laughs> um, so you know, we started looking at you know how this this could work in, in actual architecture rooms and things like that. What does it mean when a partner suddenly plays this game with the intern and whatnot? Um, all right. So then I've also done uh, classroom projects as real life role playing games. Uh, so I just gave a talk upstairs on game design syllabi. Uh, I I take the mechanisms of what needs to be accomplished in a classroom. So let's say uh, we, we are making in our class a game. I will make that sort of the end game of the course, and then I'll model a set of quests around building up towards that game. I also make my grading uh, process work in reverse. So instead of, you know, every student imagines that they start with 100 and then they get chipped down as they do correlating classes. Um, I actually say, Welcome to my class, everybody has zero points, thus you have an F. And everything you do raises your score. So, and they cannot lose points unless they don't have the class. Um, so that turns it into, rather than, uh, like a game, it becomes a system of information gathering and task production, um, rather than a system of just like, I, I think I'm doing really well on day one and then I get chopped down uh, over the course of the semester. Um, so then another thing that I've done a lot of work with is uh, architectural approaches to game design. So again, there's the architecture, game design and architecture game where they played their actual process. Um, in this model, again, wrote a book about it, um, I take games and break down their design according to architectural theory and architectural models. The flip side of this is that I actually took my experience in the architectural realm analyzing buildings, analyzing sites, analyzing things like that, and turn them into, uh, there's more Super Mario Brothers for everybody uh, who missed it. I actually turned it into analysis methods. So um, one thing that I can take into the classroom is when we talk about <coughs> dissecting 
these problems and dissecting the ways they work, dissecting what went well, what went poorly, um, dissecting the mechanisms of systems. Or really, that's what we're talking about when we say games in the classroom is, you know, what are those interesting problems? How are they systems? And how can we dissect them to learn more about them? Um, I'll take things like dissecting a level and figuring out the, uh, okay, figuring out the adjacencies. You know, what is it, if there's a ravine with a bridge above it in, in Halo 4, what does that mean? What kind of spatial experience does the ravine have? How does Super Mario Brothers model player behavior by forcing you to deal with Mario's particular jumping capabilities of like, you know, being able to jump only 10 units versus 11 units to cross this gap in level 8-1. Uh, how do we look at, can we black out all the pieces of, of architecture in a level to figure out how the visual communication is happening, how it creates these implied relationships that directs you to, through things. So I, I uh, use games as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, diagramming method in a lot of classes where I have to break down a, a complex process. Um, so really, that's all I have. Um, my Twitter is Tartar87, which is right next to Lindsay's head. Um, and I'm going to actually be posting my, it's the format, I don't know what happened there. Um, I'm going to be posting my game syllabi to a link and sharing it on that Twitter. So if uh, you follow me on Twitter, I can, um, I can share that out as well to elaborate more on that. So thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll take questions there. So I'm all in with using games in the classroom. I was saying earlier that um, I teach special education and I require my teachers to create a game based on a profile of a student and what the problems are. But I mean, it's nowhere near this level. And what occurred to me particularly when you were talking about the social interaction is one of the issues our teachers run into is classroom management. And I wonder, is that, like I said, this is so beyond my skill set. I can barely handle this. I mean, is there an opportunity for teachers to work with you all to create these kinds of scenarios? Or what are the resources available to us? <laughs> Um, well, one, any of you? Yeah, well, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, we are full time you know, research faculty. <laughs> so, uh, modulated you know, by that, it's always good to see if we can drum up new research projects. So, something like uh, making a training system to, or, or making a, a virtual environment to uh, keep, uh, you have to have like a consistent, uh, you know, social tableau for maybe someone with special education to come and have a consistent interaction with sort of like, I guess, some of the uh, therapy and training that they do. That's like a first class, like it's a, it's a good research problem. That's something that would, you know, need, uh, you know, funding, collaboration, significant amount of time to, to make to make happen. Now, if you could find a way to scale that down a bit and um, something that, that could possibly be like a paper prototype here, here is a, a card of what to do and the things that follow it. There, there's a way you can boil down that ceiling a bit that you're trying to get to into a lower fidelity form. Right. And just sort of bake the knowledge out into maybe a card game or something like that. That would, I think, be the more principal something to chat about. how do I do that? So, so I was going to say, the way you do that, because uh, it might seem like, how do you, I don't know what you're talking about, a card game. If you play a couple, I mean, you'll eventually, oh, this isn't that. Well, like, we, we do do that. Part okay. of the assignment is they take an existing game and they modify that's, it. That's so really we, good. Mm -hmm. we have Jeopardy, we have multiplication card game. I mean, it, it's all that. But it was just, it was more this social. And one of our students uh, one time did this awesome um, dealing with parents yeah. um, and helping them. How, how do you address the fact that their child might have learning issues? Yeah. And, you know, so, it was unbelievable. I'm going to chime in on the other side of it. So there's actually a really good and substantial set of. Um, research on the play theory side and the sort of developmental psychologists in particular, which is one of the um, one of the entrees into my research space, uh, have done a lot of research on um, how to structure play environments so that they continue to engage. Uh, and we borrowed some stuff in game design uh, 
and we do what we, I think game design does in general, which is grab from a bunch of different disciplines. So we grab from positive, positive uh, psychologists like um, uh, Mihai, and Mihai. Uh, but we also grab from um, Parton's like fundamental research on how people um, uh, develop socially. So there's actually a nice little model that describes um, the phases of social development that a normal human being should go through, and they start with really sort of solitary play and move towards cooperative play, where people are working towards the same goal. So we've got we've got a, a foundation for that, and uh, one of the things that a few designers have tried to do is adapt those models into uh, a kind of rubric for design, which is exactly what it sounds like you're looking for. The challenge there is, and I think that's sort of what everyone's hinting at. One of the things we do when we learn through game, or when we design games, is we learn through the experience. So Mike telling you you got to play a bunch. And then you read what happens in those environments, and that's part of why I was mentioning that when we when we design games, what we're learning to do better is to put the game out there, get the feedback, process the feedback, and really create an iterative environment. So one of the things I think I tell you right off the bat is you should encourage your students to make many games in the amount of time they have, so they don't go all in and overcommit to the yeah. one idea they had. Yeah. One thing that I do when I make game like syllabi too, and, and the reason that I got hooked into the game syllabi in particular was because I noticed all these bad habits of, of <coughs> student groups. And it's always the same thing, you know, somebody doesn't read the syllabus, somebody doesn't. Uh, there's always one outlier in a group project where there's a lazy person and then they are all like, Let's, can we kick this guy out, what can we do? Um, so I, I just codified all these rules of beyond just like that grade system of 0 to 100. I also um, said, all right, so you're in a group you are going to be this, you're gonna have this job. You know, this is your role, you know, in the role playing game. So you're an artist. <clears throat> Here's your set of tasks that you would accomplish to gain experience, to gain points in the class as the artist. And your art is going to be integrated in these ways with these other things other people are doing, and that will result in this deliverable that the whole group gets points for. Um, then when the artist doesn't do their work, okay, so programmer, you did enough work that you got your A. Well, what about this guy that screwed our group and our group project doesn't have work in it? Well, that sucks. You know, he didn't do his work. So I, I took the bad habits, uh, designed around them, and then turned them into game mechanics. And I think if you start to see patterns, you can actually start to um, make Inter d design the students' interactions. Really. So you feel like, just so you know, that's not the black box. You know, a lot of the things he's talking about came, you know, come somewhat from earlier work, right? So yeah. Based on the stuff on Lee Sheldon, who was actually a story person and just yeah. designed a, a gamified syllabus as an experiment. So there are examples. <coughs> of come by the lab, ask us some questions, yeah. and we'll show you answers. Great, thank you, Larry. Following up on thanks. Yeah. This is terrific. Um, following up on that, uh, because. We work in film production classes and teams, and there are the outliers, um, the, those who um, <clears throat> are highly productive and responsible, um, sometimes seek to help those who uh, refuse to participate um, uh, and don't get angry, but other times, obviously, it's not the case. However, in the situation where we codified this, and the person who you know, was the producer and the director, um, um, and the sound person, the location scout, did the tasks assigned and therefore can be rewarded uh, well, uh, the, but the cinematographer mm -hmm. did not. Uh, the problem that I face with that is that the, the potential portfolio piece yeah. uh, suffers. Yeah. So how do we, how do you, so, so that comes into this is at the graduate level. Yeah, and 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 well, hopefully, you know, and I've taught a lot of undergrad students these project classes, and this is where it's been really helpful. Um, when I when I do have higher level students that have to produce something that actually exists for client for a portfolio piece for a thesis, um, what that syllabus becomes, you have to take care of it in the old fashioned way where you sit the group down and you talk to them, but you at least have this, this rule book of things where you didn't do this, 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 and this, and your work is suffering because, you know, so you have at least that, that. You have a rubric. Work. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's to-do list, yeah. rubric, and game book. So one of the ways that works really well that I've done in exactly that environment is I've actually structured, we have something called many games that's the, um, 
the delta. So what it is, is a, it's a change report on a weekly basis. And you can actually, what I've, I've done with What's students and projects, the delta. Yeah. Uh, and so for change. And so one of the things you do is on a weekly basis, they evaluate each other and communicate that to me. So yeah. they're doing the self reports and saying, yeah, you were supposed to be a programmer and you just get, didn't do much programming this week. Yeah. And so they don't, one of the problems in those environments is often they get surprised at the end. Oh, it's midterm, it's final, and now I, you know, why did I get a C? Yeah, I, I, do that, I, I do that as well. So yeah. Totally, um, and that's that feedback thing that games do well. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, like, really. when you Kogan, build. Kogan actually shared, a lot of colleagues of Kogan, shared with me their team, um, their team building, System that has um, codes, codes of practice and uh, modified by the students on contracts between them. So that there is there is clarity in, in at the beginning of the semester is the responsibility. It's basically, a team <laughs> code, of, yeah. team yeah. code of ethics, and I, I, I actually work last night. Yeah. Hello, yeah. I'm an economist. Yep. And I, I am really sure that there, first of all, simulations we do, we, but I'm not going to, I mean, it's simply the, 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 the fixed investment of working on a game myself is way beyond I me, mean, given the teaching load I have, that's yeah. not as hard. <laughs> um, where would you point me towards looking? For example? Look, yeah, are there, are there So you're, you're kind of lucky in that um, uh, Avalon Hill has had this long history of making <laughs> board games that are actually modeling um, yeah. a lot of economic systems. I have upstairs uh, the, the beat inflation game from like 75 or so <laughs> when that was the big issue. And it's just that they just keep doing those, so that might be a good, if you just check out what Avalon Hill is. It's also interesting, I think, to help frame old economic views yeah. uh, as well. Since they've but are, there, are there, I mean, I, for example, times used software which has basically a mathematical model that kids can play with, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Some courses that's appropriate. I mean, I'm sure there's newer versions. But. So Kurt Squire and Constance Steinkohler talk a lot about using games, um, particularly Kurt Squire, using existing games that aren't necessarily designed to teach one thing, um, but using them to teach something else. So civilization is understanding what the intersection of religion and um, uh, industry have to do with growth or different society. So one thing you could do is apply, um, have them play games that have economic systems in them, yeah. and then have them diagnose those economic systems. Well, and, and so you get a beautiful experience that's just really engaging, and then you can say, well, let's take this apart. Yeah. Why are these coins worth so much, or how do I, you know, how do I, how's the economy evolved in this game? Well, and that's that's the challenge to everybody that wants to get into games with teaching and stuff like that, is that you, you need to say, okay, well, civilization, I'm going to get, I'm, you need to get over sort of the representation of the game, like, oh man, Gandhi is a, is a, um, psychopathic killer in, in civilization always with <coughs> you, you have to get over that and look at the underlying system so you have to think of games as abstracted systems mm -hmm. uh, you know so models models exactly just, so um at one hill doom game feudalism in space uh diplomacy world pre-world war one european politics um and they they won't give you all the system they'll give you a notion of the system that can serve as sort of a launching point for your class discussions they just released 2,500 MS DOS, MS DOS games. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so something as simple as Oregon Trail, which taught about resource management, yeah. mm -hmm. in addition to history. Um, I mean, obviously yeah. that's not for a graduate level seminar, but could be an hour. There before. might be something yeah. in there, and, mm -hmm. and, and clearly you could say this is how we used to think of resource management back when we were when we were teaching, and this is the way we teach it now. Well, I mean, that's what Oregon Trail was. It was designed and programmed originally by teachers. Yeah. <coughs> I guess I'm curious about the developing the ways of observing uh, complex systems in a way you can begin to tease apart the game dynamics and social dynamics. That feels like a different way of being than many other kinds of research. And okay. I'm wondering how you build your muscle around that or if there's resources you found to help people build that I think capacity. Uh, I mean, doing a deep analysis of a game and like trying to interpret what the system's about is something that I do, and it's kind of like cutting edge in game studies, so it's called in game academia. And um, I, I have found it to be one of the most like fruitful endeavors ever to really take seriously. Like, I'm going to interpret SimCity 2000 on its own terms, yeah. which involves maybe looking at the code. Involves it, not necessarily. That's if you understand code, but. Um, 
I, I, I keep it. I, I think writing papers, just yeah. straight up humanistic papers. Well, even beyond just like, before you even get to the paper writing, keep a gameplay journal. Play a bunch of games and write about what the game makes you think about. There's examples of this. Uh, so now it's like Corgram in the Micro World. This, what? So good. Yeah, it's basically this This uh, professor in the 1970s got an Atari and bought Super Breakout and wrote a stream of consciousness novel about him playing Super Breakout. Um, do that. Just like play a game. And, and But then include stuff like from your own research. I did this with the game Half-Life 2. I, I looked at, oh, the first level of Half-Life 2. You walk through this train station in this dystopian future, and guards push you back. And that's the mechanism of going into doors or not going into doors. And then it made me think about this architectural notion of allies where there's these little statues and it makes a space feel populated, you know? So there's, you start to keep this journal and then it becomes about your research and then all of a sudden you, you can analyze I'll that add one thing that speaks, because you said how you, play, how do you understand this stuff is, you yeah. look to expert play, um, people who are really good at playing these, whatever game it is, because those are the people who have really felt the contours of the system, so yeah. saying, right? they like really understand what's going on in there. And um, those are the ones who you can actually like, find out what is it actually, what is civilization, how is it really managing yeah. that economy. And, and uh, there's a large community of people that do that and put them yeah. in on videos YouTube, really available like, on YouTube, expert, Twitch team. There, so don't go to popular gaming websites like IGN, Kotaku, because they're going to be like, Graphics, 10, sound, 5, <laughs> you know. Go to, like YouTube, go to uh, Extra Credits. It's this show about games. And there's some really great readings of games. There's one, uh, Games and Narrative Mechanics, that talks about the post-apocalyptic design of Missile Command, you know. And you can just watch a bunch of those. And videos. Extra Credits, like, seven minutes long. They're high intensity, quick, nice little tidbits. So you can use portions of that in any class. And they introduce things that are actually cross-disciplinary. So they'll talk about, like, the Uncanny Valley and the representation. So they use game studies, uh, or games as their study, but there's plenty of stuff you can use. And, and they don't use crass jokes or dirty words. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's the problem. Like, almost that's explicitly designed for the classroom. Like, yeah. it's sort of, like, ready-made free. Are there co coming up? For? Aren't you participating? Oh uh, yeah, we're yeah, lots. So there's Magfest. Yeah. That's um, the local one. Yeah, taking games. Yeah, you're just you're doing something next too, right? I thought I got a tweet on you doing a conference or something. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a cloud. Uh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. there's yeah. GDC. Yeah. I'm presenting there, and then South by Southwest. I'm presenting it. There's there's kind of something games every month. Games for change. Yeah, games for change. Yeah, there's, play. there's at least something every month. Yeah. But, but I just wanted to chime in and say uh, to Andrew's question, um, there seems to be a barrier for non-players. Who think that playing games is somehow a special talent or a special skill, or, or even worse, maybe just some boundary or barrier that can't be crossed by normal humans? Um, the genetic ability to Yeah, and, and I, I just have to say that the best way to build the muscles is to start playing the games. And, well, and, and finding people who can help you connect with the game. Mm -hmm. So if you are more of a single player puzzler versus an adventure game person, or there are all kinds of, there are limitless styles and entry points, and, and the quality of games now is astounding. Yeah. It's astounding. And the variation and the, the wide range of sensibilities, games made by young women, games made by people in different demographics or different cultures or different, with different predispositions. The, a, a, a good question, I, I think the game lab should start like that. Open open lab session on Thursdays at three. Oh, have the grad yeah. students, have the grad students and Show faculty um, just just serve as like you know I want to come in. I'm I'm really curious about economics. Oh, there's this great yeah, game right called now. Don't Starve, which is really my daughter and I played for yeah. like 30 hours over over holiday break. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's it's an incredible game. Yeah. Incredible yeah. game. I, I will say Perfect this. for economics. I, I will say this. Um, as a person who analyzes games professionally, and thus everybody assumes that I'm awesome at every game, I have, I have to uh, admit I suck at Pong. <laughs> but like being good or bad at a game is, has nothing to do with your ability to like analyze it. So yeah, don't worry about it. it this is maybe a little bit of a risk, but I'll say it anyway. And if you want to come up, we uh, we have a, a main machine, which is a multi arcade uh, in the game lab that actually has a large set. Uh, 50 historical games. 
So everything from Dragon's Lair was the first 2D experience. So, yeah, you can yeah, you stop by and play, and, and you know, it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> yeah, working for new Street Fighter opponents all the time. <laughs> so, another quick comment to come, uh, uh, add to what Jeff said. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of travel in just this last week uh, for a project at the SOC. Um, and my grandson, who's five, uh, downloaded Angry Birds, uh, unbeknownst to me, on my iPhone. And I said, what you, you know, what's this? He said, no, it's going to whatever. So you know, well, I played it on the plane coming back last yesterday afternoon. Here, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to think about what I learned in physics in high school about trajectory, mass, velocity, and problem solving before I shoot those being birds and <laughs> what attributes each of those birds is. Yeah. And um, so, oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, so it's, it's, it is actually the subtext in some cases. <laughs> I like to use the comparison of you become like Neo in the Matrix, that moment where he like sees the code around him and it's is like, like uh, no. <laughs> 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 I think there's one question back there. Yeah, so uh, I'm putting my education researcher hat on and I'm kind of curious, what, I, I want to know what's the big documentable um, education wing in gaming. So that is to say, everything you've talked about is usually, or a lot of what was talked about is this connection, the simulation to actually what's what's out there, and that this is either a venue to using human heuristic uh, knowledge to actually push forward things we can't simulate, or to teach people, humans, things that are out there. But there is, as, as was mentioned in the grads, uh, the grads version of uh, the class, there is a final output. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, and it's two questions. One is, what is the real, what's been the real documentable educational win? Something where they can say, Hey, yeah, we couldn't do this educationally before. Now we have this game, and we documented that this happened. And the second is, what's the boundary of that? Where where are people working? Where like the social ones are really interesting to me. I think that's really complex. The idea of like, oh, I can so document I can people are socially. Two fast. studies yeah. that are um, really great, and I think uh, are sort of like easy evidence for a lot of people and really resonate. Um, the first is a game called Remission, which was, we're going we're gonna to use the claim and then I'm going to correct it. So it, um, it's a game that cures cancer. Uh, what it actually does is it changes um, uh, players' uh, tendency to uh, uh, adhere to their medicine regimen. So they play this game and all the control studies demonstrate that without playing the game, they, especially sort of uh, kids between the age of 10 and 15, tend not to take their medicines when they should and, and communicate. But when they play the game, they improve significantly because they're adhering to the regimen. Uh, the other, and these are both older studies, so I'm using that as a good sort of example, is the one, um, and I forgot what it's entitled, but the short version is, uh, they've done multiple studies of surgeons, and this is the obvious one, uh, and because the growth of laparoscopic surgery, which is basically you, a machine, and the patient, uh, they've demonstrated that players of any kind of high action game, particularly first person shooters, but a variety, are much more effective laparoscopic surgeons than non players. And I can tell you from experience, and I, I haven't documented or you know put this research out. Um, I could, you know, um, <coughs> but when I've done the, the game syllabi class, um, when I, I you know I had taught it. Uh, the class previously without the syllabi and for the project one and uh, we had I'd say about third to a half of the groups in the class would actually have some completable game that you know and this was a class that we had clients for the clients would seriously consider a document <coughs> for what they were trying to do um, when I started using the game syllabi suddenly the the choices the clients had to make became very difficult because You'd maybe have one or like one group that didn't have a full, you know, built-out game, but the rest because they had the the game notions of like the immediate feedback, knowing where their where they were in the class, knowing what their list of quests were, um, they were like, okay, they had a better notion of what they were building, and thus a better outcome. I want to sort of like caveat some of the things we're we're saying is that that studying games and education is a whole field unto itself yeah. through which we are only peripherally connected. Yeah. So we study games for you know, thinking our properties of games themselves, not uh, to use them as educational tools. Well, that's 
something that we are sort of touching now. Uh, it's not our main line. Yeah, a specific one I really liked um, that was documented, whatever science and all that, um, was uh, the Kurt Swire's work on Civilization Three. Mm -hmm. uh, it was God. Um, specifically, they find when you play a game, then have the discussion. They have like documented uh, proof that you learn more than the traditional something or other. Yeah. I just want to share, you know, another sort of personal experience and then give a plug for our friends at CTRL is that I was doing a class and it had previously had a simulation when another professor had done it. So it was a combating terrorism and so one side was the terrorists doing their strategy and one was the government with their counter strategy. And I wanted to automate it a little bit, couldn't find a good system to inject in and you know to do what you were saying about afterward, you know, analyze your strategy, why did it work, whatever. And so I flipped it around and with CTRL, CTRL's help made designing a game the project of the class. And so they had, we had three rounds and each time the teams had to come up with what were the four options that the player would get to pick from. And in doing that, I think they actually learned more about the theories of strategy than if they just had played someone else's yeah. version of their options. And, and, what, and had to think. what happens when you play test these games is yeah. when they don't work, then you talk about why they don't work and right. then thus there's your like, and because in the real world the system is this, and you thought you were going to do this, and that's why, you know, when they tried that in blah blah blah, you know, not that's too obvious, obvious, but the discipline of game theory and economics is very much based on this idea that we've got, we've got yeah. social dynamics we can play them through. So CCRL has uh, uh, well, a fairly new games and education group. You know, looks like they're willing, yeah. to, trying to make games for educational purposes. So, does everyone want to check that out? Yeah. yeah. Perhaps we can organize a special session, maybe with more interactive, maybe with the game. <laughs> 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 open up yeah. the doors. Yeah. 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 We need to. We yeah. need to have an open house. We can talk about. Open up yeah. the doors, <laughs> box. <laughs> Great. And then show people. Here's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Maybe we should call it there. Yep. Um, Great. Yeah, we'll be right there. Thank you.